In this video, we're going to do a quick review on our chapter on animal behavior and behavioral ecology. In biology, when we discuss animal behavior, we always need to look at the two types of causes of animal behavior. The proximate causation, or the immediate sequence of physiological events that lead to the observed behavior. For example, when we look at songbirds and why they sing, the male birds will sing in the springtime, but that singing is triggered by a change in a hormone level. That's the direct cause of the behavior. The hormones drive the birds to sing. But what's the ultimate causation? Why? Why do birds sing at all? Well, there's an adaptive value to that behavior. It has evolutionary origins. So the ultimate causation has to do with what's the evolutionary benefit of that behavior? In this case, this, when the male bird sings, it attracts female birds that they can mate with. It also may mark its territory and have other males stay away so that this behavior of singing actually increases the bird's evolutionary fitness and allows them to be uh, able to pass their genes along better. Now as we discuss behavior in biology, we need to ask ourselves the question, is the behavior uh, a natural thing, an inborn thing? Is it due to nature, the biology, or to nurture experience? Are the behaviors inborn? Are they predetermined? Or are they learned and influenced by the environment? Well, the answer to that question is always, it's both. Behavior is influenced and sometimes determined by genes, hormones, which interact with the environment. Here's a quick example. Sparrow song. The behavior of sparrow song arises due to genetic hardwiring and experiences. If you raise sparrows in a soundproof chamber, They'll sing. They'll sing the basic generic sparrow song, but it will lack all the subtle variations that help us distinguish between one group of sparrows and another. If you expose these birds to recordings of different groups of sparrows, they'll typically learn best the, uh, the song of their subspecies. But if you have a real sparrow as a tutor, even though it may be a, a different subspecies, um, it will learn that song a little better. So there's a genetic pre-wiring uh, to learn song, but then the influence of the environment and experience that then adjusts that learning. So if we understand that some behavior is governed directly or indirectly by genes, then we know that those behaviors are subject to natural selection. So if a behavior has persisted or has become more prevalent, then it must have some adaptive value, some evolutionary value that outweighs its cost. So as we look through uh, this topics on behavior. We're going to look at the individual benefit of those behaviors, kind of cost analysis, for example, in optimal foraging. Uh, does it help us with reproductive success? We'll look at social behaviors and the, the benefit of social behaviors and the difference between selfish and altruistic behaviors. But let's start with the simple behaviors, those innate behaviors that are developmentally fixed. When if we say developmentally fixed, that means they happen the same way every time. For example, when these birds hatch, they instinctively turn their faces upwards and open their mouths. It's always the same. It's an instinctive behavior. They're born knowing how to do it, just like a human baby will uh, grasp anything that you put in their hand. It's already hardwired uh, to respond to certain, to certain stimulus. But the question is, what's the evolutionary significance of fixing these behaviors? Well, it kind of takes the guesswork out of it. The this behavior has been selected for, any animal that doesn't exhibit this behavior decreases their chances of survival. These innate behaviors are almost always the correct behavior in terms of a surviving standpoint or an evolutionary standpoint. Any one of these little ducklings that didn't choose to innately follow their mother and wandered off over here would certainly decrease its chances of surviving. Oftentimes these behaviors that are developmentally fixed occur in what we call a fixed action pattern. They happen the same way every time. And here's an interesting example. Uh, Tinnenberg did a, a study with the male three-spined spickled stickleback fish. And these fish are very uh, territorial. If uh, another fish comes in their territory, the male fish will attack it and drive it out and make it leave um, to defend its territory. And we know that there's an adaptive value to defending your territory. But the question is, what is it about the other fish that is a, it is signaling to this fish that it needs to attack? And so an experiment was done where they took a model of the stickleback 
It looks just like the stickleback in its shape and form, but it doesn't have the red underbelly. Now the female sticklebacks don't have that red underside. And if you put this model, even made out of wood, uh, maybe not even that uh, accurate of a model, the three st uh, the stickleback will ignore it and won't attack it. It'll just leave it alone. But if you take some model that maybe isn't isn't even very fish-like, but paint its underside red, the stickleback will attack it. There's some stimulus. It's not the shape of the fish because it ignores this. It's this specific red uh, on gray uh, pattern with the red on the bottom. And like I said, they used models that were not even very fish-like. They moved kind of from the more fishy looking to the much less fishy looking. And anytime they saw this pattern, the stickleback would attack. And it would attack in this very uh, obvious pattern or very predictable pattern of behavior. It's called a fixed action pattern. And the red underbelly is what we call the sign stimulus. Let's see. Sign stimulus. The sign stimulus is the stimulus that sets off the fixed action pattern. And then to show that just that it wasn't um, a, spoo uh, uh, a fluke, it, it would attack this model right here, but it would ignore this one. As soon as you took the red off, it would ignore that one. In review, we also studied, studied Nico Tinbergen's WASP experiment that showed that WASP use um, visual uh, landmarks to locate their nest. He outlined it, and they the wasp moved the pine cones and the wasp came back and the wasp looked over here for its nest and later put the pine cones back in a triangle and it, but it moved towards the circle and so we discussed that one in class I'm not going to go into that one in too much detail in, in this video uh, but let's look at the cost benefit analysis of foraging behavior uh, so when we look at any behavior uh, where we have to spend energy we need to decide um, we need to decide now, what's the the correct uh, amount of energy to spend for the reward we're gonna get gain? So, if you have a choice between uh, staying in an area, let's say you have a, an area or a boundary, and over in this, I need a different pen. Over in this area, whoops, try one more time. You know, over in this area, you have food, but it's not really high quality food. But over here, you've heard there's a lot of really good food. But you have to decide: is it worth the cost of traveling this distance? to get to this food, open yourself up to possibly danger uh, in the travel to get there and the energy to spend to get there. Is the payoff of the food you get here worth it or should you just stay over in this area with this lower quality food that you don't have to spend much energy getting to? And it's not necessarily an easy formula but we're always making these decisions uh, in terms of like a cost benefit of analysis to determine what is the right decision and the best way to optimize that. And any time you spend more energy than you benefit uh, or gain from that decision, you've decreased your evolutionary fitness. And any decision or behavior that you engage in where the, re the reward is greater than the energy spent uh, would increase your evolutionary fitness. Now let's move on to learning. And the first thing we did when we started talking about learning, we said we had to be careful of maturation. Sometimes what we see that looks like learning is just a physical maturation. As our neural development and muscular development changes, it might look that a bird learns to fly when in fact it's just a maturation of its muscle system and its nervous system. But we do learn. Uh, animals learn, and this is part of their behavior, where they in process and uh, integrate information that's gained through experience. Learning involves experience and they use those experiences to vary or change their behavior in response to stimulus in the future. One very simple type of learning is called habituation where we learn to ignore irrelevant stimulus or stimulus that doesn't provide us any good feedback. I want you to stop and think and write down some examples of habituation. Basically if some stimulus doesn't help or hurt us we probably should ignore it so we can focus on other things that may help or hurt us. Another type of learning that we uh, looked at was imprinting, which is learning that has to happen during a critical period. It's kind of very hard to unlearn. And we looked at Conrad Lorenz and his imprinting of the geese on himself. And I'm not going to rehash that in this video. It's pretty simple, and you can read through your notes and look at your book at that one. But the key to that is that it occurs during a critical period. And they do learn something. They're learning to connect a stimulus with, uh, with, uh, with the result there. The other example we talked about were the salmon uh, returning to the river of their birth. 
Let's move on to more complex learning though, uh, associative learning. And the first type of associative learning is classical conditioning. Uh, and again, I'm not going to go through the entire process again, but just to remind you that that's something you need to review for your test. Um, the story of Pavlov's dog and the association of one stimulus with another, the conditioned stimulus with a neutral stimulus, I'm sorry, the unconditioned stimulus, the food with a neutral stimulus, the bell, such that eventually after repeated pairings, the bell becomes a conditioned stimulus uh, eliciting a conditioned response more interesting would be to think of a, a, a more realistic real-world animal behavior of associative learning and think if you can come up with one uh, before the test and the other type of associative learning is operant conditioning or trial and error learning where a be an animal engages in a behavior and that behavior is either reinforced or punished uh, rewarded or punished and if the behavior results in a positive consequence that behavior will tend to increase and if the behavior results in a negative consequence, the behavior will tend to decrease. Uh, it's very obvious in the Skinner box how the rat could use this feedback of getting food for pressing the lever to learn to press it more, or getting shocked to press the lever to learn to, sh to press it less. But again, try to find or think of some real-world animal uh, examples of operant conditioning. Then we spent time in class very briefly talking about the role of play and this behavior of play and what it might do for animals, um, basic as practice of adult behavior and also forming of social bonds through play. And we spent a very little bit of time talking about insight learning, the type of learning that we use where past experience is kind of modified to solve some new problem um, in terms of some problem solving. Next, I want to briefly review the um, things we talked about for animal movement. Basically, we need to make sure we can discriminate between kinesis and taxis as types of movement. Uh, taxis is very simply um, orienting or moving in response to a specific stimulus. The salmon is turning to face upstream uh, so the food will come towards its mouth. That's not random. There's a stimulus that it's responding to. Moving towards or away from uh, sunlight or shade or hot or cold would be directed or taxis movement. But kinesis movement is kind of a random movement. An animal moves randomly until it gets to where it wants to be. So if you have an animal that's moving, and as it's moving out here, it's light and dry, and it might move around really fast, but when it gets to moist and dark, its rate of movement might slow down. So it moves slowly and slowly, and uh, if it gets out here, it starts moving faster, random movement faster. If it gets into moist and dark, it slows down. Maybe if it's under this rock and you pick the rock up and move it, it'll scurry away and move until it gets to another moist and dark and then it slows down again. It's not directed. It doesn't know it's going towards moist and dark, but when it gets there, it moves less and therefore stays in this environment that's favorable for a longer period of time. I'm going to stop the video now and uh, upload it and then quickly make a, a short part two about social behaviors in animals and then just kind of wrap up. So uh, come back for part two.